Well, one of my favorite Sundays of the year is Mother's Day. I always enjoy speaking on God's amazing invention of mothers. In our local church alone, I'm so proud to see so many devoted mothers and grandmothers, mothers and grandmothers who pray for their children, teach their children, who have many have given that personal dreams and goals for their children, and these are moms who have no really greater aspiration than to see their children following Christ. And I want to say a special shout out to uh, my own wife, Sylvia. She has been an amazing mother, a great example, very, very consistent. And uh, we had a, a nice family celebration yesterday since she's without me on Mother's Day every, every year uh, because uh, I'm a pastor. So, hi, Sylvia. I love you, and you're a great mom. And I want to say to all of the mothers watching, I send you a hearty, happy Mother's Day. And I would love to preach a hearty, happy Mother's Day sermon today. I can't today. This particular week has been filled with a rapidly developing set of news cycles, which I'm sure you've all followed, in which now even Christians are quickly dividing into camps concerning how much we ought to or ought not to protest and be angered by government actions related to the coronavirus pandemic. In particular, local churches are having to establish their position in light of the fact that the government, the federal government giving guidelines and the state governments issuing mandates that the, that the local church cannot meet together. And we're in, I believe, our eighth Sunday now of live streaming. Some state governors have done amazing and helpful things. And you've read about those. Other state governors have put forward ridiculous standards that even a small child could recognize as illogical. And now lines are being drawn and two camps are basically being divided. One camp is calling for accountability for the government trampling First Amendment constitutional rights of assembly and freedom of religion. And another camp is calling for obedience to the government regardless of how oppressive it may feel at times. And now this becomes particularly poignant for us because it seems that at least in the state of California, our ability to assemble together as, as churches may be delayed for a while longer. It may come back faster than we think, but clearly there is still a delay. And because of this issue, at the request of the elders of Grace Bible Church, I'm going to explain our position regarding this issue. When it comes to Grace Bible Church as an entity, as a local body of believers in Christ, and it's my hope this will be helpful to all of us as Christians. Now basically what I'm going to talk to you about is what is our mandate as Christians when the government disappoints us? Because the government does disappoint us. But before I explain our position, I want to just review a few facts that are true regardless of where you may fall on this particular issue. I'll just do three of them. These are just facts. It doesn't matter what, what you believe about what we should do with them. This is just truth. Fact number one, unconstitutional is not the same as persecution. Unconstitutional is not the same as persecution. If an elected or an appointed official acts in a way which is contrary to the Constitution of the United States, that doesn't automatically make that an action of persecution. So we need to be precise in our definition of persecution. Uh, for example, I've heard many believers throw around a, a self-serving interpretation of Peter's famous declaration in Acts 4.19. Peter and John answering the Jerus Jerusalem council saying, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. And this becomes now a mantra for civil disobedience against anything with which I disagree. But what Peter and John were answering was the Sanhedrin, the Jerusalem council, telling them that they could not speak or teach in the name of Jesus. That has not happened during the COVID-19 crisis. No official has said that Christians cannot proclaim the gospel of Christ. So unconstitutional is not the same as persecution. Fact number two, religious gatherings have not been singled out Mass gatherings have been. Religious gatherings have not been singled out. Mass gatherings have been. 
In a very fair and expert analysis by a Christian constitutional law attorney who also happens to serve as a senior legal advisor to our president, this attorney explains that if state government singles out churches as being non-essential, then that would be unconstitutional. That would be a violation of our First Amendment rights. But overall, that hasn't happened. This attorney writes this. Government's action to present, pro, prohibit rather mass gatherings, including church gatherings, is constitutionally sound for the temporary time frame that the Wuhan coronavirus provides a compelling state interest rationale for stay-at-home orders. Uh, that's a long sentence to say, as long as people are getting sick, they have the right to prohibit gatherings. The virus is highly contagious, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommendations are the best-known ways to stop its spread. Because the virus does not distinguish between mass concert gatherings and mass church gatherings, the government can properly issue a neutral order that does not intentionally target religious groups. And then fact number three. The first two might have irritated you, but the third one you'll like. State governments, in many cases, have overstepped their bounds and restricted freedoms in ways which are unnecessary. State governments have overstepped their bounds in many cases and restricted freedoms in unnecessary ways. If you read the news at all, you've probably heard about in Texas the, the case of the hair salon owner who was thrown into jail for refusing to apologize to a judge for her noncompliance of the stay-at-home order, and that, that makes the hairs on the back of our neck stand up. It makes us bristle. Fortunately, the state Supreme Court ordered her release, and the governor amended the stay-at-home order that no one will be incarcerated for violations. And you've read many, many other examples. Which brings us to our question for today. What is the Christian's mandate when the government disappoints us? What do we do? I've got to tell you, this study that I engaged in this week, it's been a great comfort and even at times a conviction to my own heart because right now opinions and divisions are flying. They're flying in print media, in social media, and so I take great comfort in falling back on the clarity of Scripture and Scripture alone, of falling back on the inerrancy of Scripture and Scripture alone, of falling back on the authority of Scripture and Scripture alone. There is no other authority for me. There is no other authority for you. We do what the Bible says. And so this morning, we're going to see what it says. We're going to primarily examine three passages today. The first one will kind of serve as our introduction, and the second two as our guide for what to do when the government disappoints us. So our first passage this morning, turn with me to the book of Titus, the book of Titus chapter 3. And I wanted to start in Titus because I think that as Americans, we can relate to the people to whom the book of Titus would benefit. This is written to uh, Titus, but also more broadly to Christians on the island of Crete. Paul is writing Titus, his representative, who is to instruct the new churches in Crete and appoint elders in these churches. But why would we as Americans relate to the people of Crete from 2,000 years ago? Well, the people of Crete had a long and storied history. They lived through a very dark age from about 1200 B.C. to 800 B.C., this was a dark age because outside invaders had forced the Cretans to move their beautiful seaside villages and their fertile farmland to go up into the mountains, up into the most inhospitable, rocky, difficult, windswept mountain locations where they could be defended and easily fortified. And so for 400 years, they fought for and they valued their freedom. Crete became an unofficial colony of Rome, Rome didn't enforce direct control, but in the 70s B.C., civil uprisings were increasing by Jewish settlers, likely in a bid for independence from Rome. And it began to destabilize the prov province. It caused chaos and disorder and violence and, and economic problems. And so eventually, Rome came and they attacked Crete in 71 B.C. Well, the Cretans weren't going to have anything of it, and they, they repelled the attack. And it took Three years for the mighty Roman Empire to finally conquer Crete. But eventually, after a long war, Crete was conquered by Rome once and for all in about 66 B.C. Or to put it in terms we can relate to, the war for independence in Crete was lost. 
In other words, the only difference between America and Crete is that we won our war for independence and they lost theirs. And so they, like us, have a heritage of a fierce streak of independence. And it is to this particular conquering government, the Romans, that Paul refers to in Titus chapter 3. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. Remind them, this is the, to the believers in Crete, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Notice Paul says to remind them. This is a word that says cause them to think about it again. Paul had left Titus in Crete after having ministered there together. And Paul is telling Titus, cause them to think about this again, that they must be submissive to rulers and authorities. Well, what does that mean? How does it work itself out? Well, he gives a list. By being obedient, doing every good work, speaking evil of no one, avoiding quarreling, being gentle, and showing perfect courtesy toward all people. I don't know how Paul could be clearer. There's no lack of clarity here at all. And so my main idea today, I'm taking it straight from Scripture. There, there will be no variation here to make certain it's accurate. Here's my main idea. As a church body, the bride of Christ, we should, quote, be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. As the church body, the bride of Christ, we should, quote, be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. I'm going to give you some reasons for this. And listen, if you're unhappy with my main idea this morning, argue with God. I'm just quoting him. Now, we've introduced this idea to begin giving his reasons. Turn over with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter's writing to believers who either are or shortly are about to be under persecution, real persecution, the kind that will get you killed. This is very important to remember because we're going to see a stunning command from a man, Peter, not previously known for his commitment to being compliant. But look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2 and we'll read verses 13 through 17. 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who, are, who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the emperor. I'm going to give you some reasons that as a church body, the bride of Christ, we should be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. And by the way, all these reasons are God-centered. They're God-centered. They're not man-centered. They're centered on giving glory to God alone. Reason number one, as a church body, the bride of Christ, we should be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. Reason number one, to demonstrate loyalty to God. To demonstrate loyalty to God. And I'm going to spend the lion's share of my time on this this morning. Then we'll move on to some other reasons. Peter says we're to be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake. Literally in Greek, on account of the Lord. Well, what does this mean? Well, this is really our foundational reason. And it's stated in very beautiful minimalist terms. Now, let me give it to you in a way that maybe you can relate to. On Mother's Day... If you can uh, picture your own children doing this, it's like two brothers who are messing around in the house when mom isn't looking, and younger brother is about to try to hurdle one of the couches, and the older brother says, you'd better not, and the younger brother says, give me one good reason. The older brother says, mom, and that says it all. Mom says no. Mom doesn't want you to. We obey mom and basically what peter's doing here is saying be subject to every human institution because god said so and that should be reason enough i should be able to close in prayer right now and you be convicted that we will obey if you love god then you're loyal to god and loyalty is expressed in obedience now i do have to say this 
Many have cited Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 as a reason the church should consider ignoring the state's stay-at-home order. I've considered this text as well. It says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And this is true. We are commanded to assemble. But is the context, if the government is restricting your assembly, you should rebel? No. We should point out that the context is, as is the habit of some. This is not to push back against rebellion from outside sources. This is to push back against rebellion from our own hearts. To push back against rebellion of a heart attitude and a lack of priority of those who don't view the church gathering as important, who are lackadaisical about their gathering with the body. And so what do we do? He says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That is something we can do, and we're doing that now. At this very moment, that is happening. And so, respectfully and humbly, I'd like to say that Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, the context is not pushing back against those who would prevent us from assembling. That's another subject for another day. Unfortunately, our situation currently has led to some pointing out churches which are defying the governor's orders. And that becomes anecdotal so-called evidence that all churches should do that. Well, such and such church is, or so-and-so pastor is. And by the way, I'll have more to say in a moment about pastors, what they're supposed to be doing. Many of them have besmirched the name of Christ and forgotten their true duty. I'll do that in a bit. We're happy to consider what others are doing and what they're thinking. But listen, what others do is not a hermeneutic. It's not a means by which we evaluate Scripture's mandates. And in fact, I think in many cases, it substitutes for actually considering what Scripture has said. In reading what some pastors who are encouraging, pushing back and rebelling have written, I have not seen one single compelling biblical argument which holds water hermeneutically. It just doesn't. No, instead, we're content to make judgments based on what Scripture would have us to do while carefully considering the actions of godly men, not hot-headed, argumentative men. They're the last people you should be looking to. Those are the ones who would have us make decisions based in emotion or seeing their duty as defending the Constitution. Listen, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton would probably counsel us to rebel under abuses of power in order to maintain our republic. Peter says no. He says no. And if we truly believe in the sovereignty of God, if he wants our republic to remain, it will. And if he doesn't, it won't. As a matter of fact, I want to put this loyalty reason into the context of the gospel of Christ. That is really the proper context. The gospel of Christ is that God is holy and perfect, but mankind, that's you, that's me, has violated God's perfection and his law in every way possible. And you were therefore unworthy to live and are condemned to die and to be punished for all eternity in hell. But praise God, Christ stepped in and he paid your penalty, which was owed to God. He paid this penalty at the cross. The wages of sin is death and Christ paid it. And if you've repented, if you've turned away from your loyalty to your sin and turned instead to Christ then you may be saved and set apart as a child of the living God. Now, in that gospel context, what did Jesus say a child of God does? He said in Mark 8, 34, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Take up his cross is not just speaking of suffering. It's speaking of dying to yourself. It's an expression of total loyalty and devotion. And this loyalty and devotion is expressed in how we live, as Peter says, for the Lord's sake. And this is everywhere in the New Testament. 
Well, we could take Ephesians chapters 5 and 6 as an example. Wives submit to husbands as to the Lord. Children submit to parents in the Lord. Bond servants obey your earthly masters as you would Christ from a willing heart. All the commands to husbands in the New Testament to love and to cherish their wives are because of the Lord and for His sake. The, the Christian life is a life of submission. There's no such thing as an unsubmitted Christian. The New Testament doesn't know that entity. If you're a Christian, you're submissive. And so we do, do we stop submitting to those in authority over us merely because they disappoint? Well, if we did, then all of our authority structures would crumble. Listen, I'm a pastor I'm an elder in a local church, and if everyone in our church who was ever disappointed in me quit being submissive, we, all we'd have left is the nursery. And as soon as they could figure out, they would leave. If you quit submitting to an employer every time he disappoints you, you'd be looking for a new job every two weeks. If your children quit submitting to you every time you disappoint them as parents, your house would be in perpetual chaos. No, we submit for the Lord's sake, because God, Abba, Father, said so. Let me give you a second reason that as a church body, the bride of Christ, we should be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. Reason number two, to respect God's decisions. To respect God's decisions. Peter says that we are to be subject to every human institution, and then he gives an example. Whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him. He calls the emperor of Rome supreme. This is a word that means one who is above you, one who is risen over you, one who is highly placed. And now it's right about at this point that many would like to point out that our form of government is different. It's less restrictive than certainly the Roman Empire, and that's true. But the fact that that's true means that if Peter were here with us, with us saying, let, let me explain this text to you a little further, you know what he could logically say? He could logically say, if God commanded me in my day to submit to a supreme emperor who was emperor for life, who was essentially a dictator, then submitting to governors whom you can simply vote out of office in a couple years, should be no problem. But just how supreme is the leadership placed over us? How supreme are they? Well, not as supreme as we think they are. They do precisely what God says. They do what God in His sovereignty and His providence would have them to do. Proverbs 21.1, listen to this. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Thus, who made the decision in the state of California to issue a four-stage plan for reopening the state? God did. And by the way, just a reminder, God did not sign the Declaration of Independence, nor did he sign the Constitution. God is not bound by the Constitution of the United States in his decisions. So there's really only two choices. Either you respect God's decisions or you do not. There's no in between. Now, also in God's sovereignty, we enjoy a form of government, really unprecedented in history, in which one can peacefully use the court system and other peaceful, respectful means to petition the government to change some of those decisions. All of you can run for office if you so choose. But listen, if your first instinct is non-compliance, you are wrong. You are absolutely wrong. If you're trying to lead others to non-compliance, that's like a sibling trying to get the kids to disobey mom and dad. And that's wrong. Romans 12, or Romans 13, rather, 1 and 2 is very clear. Let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Not necessarily talking about eternal judgment. It's just if you break the law, you're going to get punished. 
Don't be enthralled by government bashers. They are out of the will of God. There's no place in the Bible you see this being mandated. Let me give you a third reason that as a church body, the bride of Christ, we should be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. Reason number three, to express your love for God. To express your love for God. 1 Peter 2, verse 15 begins, For this is the will of God. This is the will of God. Peter is not one for subtlety. He says, Be subject to every human institution, for this is the will of God. This is, in Greek, God's wish. It is what pleases Him. It's His desire. I read one pastor who said that he and his leadership were praying about whether or not to obey the government. And since we've already established that the government is not asking you to sin or to stop proclaiming Christ, then what is there to pray about? And I, I can't imagine what that leadership meeting must have been like in the prayer meeting. Oh, God, help us as we choose to dishonor and ignore your word. Give us strength, Lord, to disregard the very clear instruction of Scripture. And we beseech you, God, to guide us as we selectively interpret the Bible to fit our American ideals. No. We obey because it's God's will. But what does it have to do with expressing love for God? Jesus, God in the flesh, said very simply in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's that simple. Do you love Christ? Then obey him. Well, but I don't want to. Oh, then you don't love Christ. No, I do love Christ. Then obey him. But I don't feel like it. Well, then you don't love Christ. Well, see how it goes? You have two choices. If you love him, obey him. Listen, if anyone had a right to push back and to protest a disappointing government, it would have been Jesus. When Jesus was on earth, the Roman rulers of Israel were quite literally seated on his throne. He is the rightful king of Israel. Caesar proclaimed himself the king of all the kings, and yet the true king of kings, the true Lord of lords, submitted to him in all things. And when given the opportunity to protest his innocence before a Roman authority, he didn't say a thing. He remained silent as a sheep before its shears. In fact, Jesus never one time advocated any level of protest against the government, even to the point that when he could have been made king, he would escape the clutches of those who would elevate him. Why was this the case? Because Jesus loved his father, and it was not his father's will that Jesus cry out against Rome. It was his father's will that Jesus be crucified by Rome. And Jesus knowing the full agony which awaited him, proclaimed to his father, not as I will, but as you will. There are lots of things which are the will of God which are not easy, they're not convenient, and they're not pleasant at the time. And yet, we obey. Why? Because we love God. Let me give you a fourth reason that as a church body, the bride of Christ, we should be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. Reason number four, to rightly represent God. To rightly represent God. Any opportunity to obey is not just about you, it's about how you're going to represent God on earth. Look at the second part of 1 Peter 2.15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Listen, the Christian faith is transformative. You're a new creation in Christ, and yet if we give the appearance of being just as hostile and unsubmissive as others, we've misrepresented God. Now, who is Peter speaking of here? Who are the foolish people whom we are to silence? The foolish people are those who accuse Christians of being above the law, of thinking themselves above the law. And we're not trying to silence them as in win the argument. Argumentative Christians are counterproductive to the gospel, but we're trying to silence them for the sake of the gospel itself. 
In fact, look back in this very same text to verse 12 of 1 Peter 2. Verse 12, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. We're to silence them by giving them nothing but good to say about us such that they observe transformed lives and glorify God on the day of visitation. What does this mean, to glorify God? This is a phrase used in the New Testament to speak of getting saved. That's how we win the argument, by being so above reproach that others notice our transformed lives. Listen, you bear the name of Christ. You are a Christian, Greek, a little Christ. You and I do not get to smear the name just because we're inconvenienced or just because even we're suffering. And how shameful it is when churches and pastors make headlines because of anger and because of a fighting spirit. And then when they suffer, they cry out, persecution! Well, what do we say to that? We don't have to say anything. Peter said it for us. Look at verse 20 of this same chapter. 1 Peter 2, verse 20. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. What a wasted opportunity when pastors are leading their people to be angry, to be overreactive, to be pugnacious, to be belligerent, to be argumentative, to be contentious. How does that represent God? How does that set the Christian apart from the world? Now, there is, of course, a place and a time to calmly disobey the authorities when unjust laws require us to sin. For example, it would be an unjust law that would require a pastor to perform a wedding between two homosexuals. I will happily disobey that because it requires me to sin, and I'm not going to do it. But until such a situation occurs, our conviction is that we are first citizens of heaven. You are an appointed representative of the kingdom of God, and as such, you are charged with behaving as such. Let me give you a fifth reason that as a church body, the bride of Christ, we should be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. Reason number five, to follow God's priorities. To follow God's priorities. In fact, Peter summarizes this in verse 17. In verse 17, he says, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. This is a staccato list of commands here. And Peter tells us what our lives are to be about. And I want you to notice this. The combination is possible all at the same time. This is not, these aren't mutually exclusive commands. We're not called to either fear God or honor the emperor. It is by honoring the emperor that we fear God. They're not mutually exclusive. We do them all. And this short series of commands is so useful, so direct, and so to the point. Moms and dads, remember when your little ones are, are, are tiny and they're rebelling against you because they're little sinners? And it's like a dad, and I used to do this. You, you take the little toddler in his head, in, his, in your hands, because what do they want to do when they're rebelling? Well, they want to look everywhere, right? And you get their little head, and you, and you make them look at you. And what do they do with their eyes? Their eyes go, Roop, this way, that way, that way, that way. But they won't look right at you. Why? Because they're guilty, and their little heart's in rebellion. This is Dad taking our head in his hands, putting our eyes in front of his, and saying, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. But, but, but I, I can't, I, I don't want to. I, 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 I. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This isn't complex. What are God's priorities for you? Everyone in your homes, say it with me. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. You were all embarrassed and you didn't do it very well. So let's do it again. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And who are the ones who are supposed to remind the believers of God's priorities? It is to be the shepherds of the church. Now, to be a shepherd, to be a pastor, 
It's a really, really long job description. In fact, in this same book, we find the job description of the shepherds of the church. So look with me at 1 Peter chapter 5. Here's the really, really long job description, 1 Peter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders, those are pastors among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Here's the long job description. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. That's it. Oh, there must be more to it than that. Shepherd them to do what? Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. It is not, it is not the duty of the shepherd of the church to defend the Constitution. It is the shepherd's duty to defend the flock, the flock of God from sinful waywardness and to teach them to submit to and to trust a sovereign God. How can we preach the sovereignty of God and the minute anything gets just a little bit difficult, we find human solutions immediately? And you might say, yes, but what about government oppression? What about when injustice happens? Absolutely. Let's address that in the way that Jesus did. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because someday... Isaiah chapter 9 promises us, for us, to, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace. There will be no end. All government oppression, all government injustice, all government sinful actions will be brought to account. But ultimately, this will be when Christ returns, and thus we are to be patient. And, and I understand your pain, I understand your frustration, you might ask, but what am I supposed to do in the meantime? Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Let me give you a sixth reason that as a church body, the bride of Christ, we should be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. And this one might surprise you. Reason number six, to become more godly. To become more godly. Turn with me now to 1 Timothy chapter 2, back just a few pages. 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is going to give instruction to the church concerning prayer. But it's going to have immediate implications for our behavior. 1 Timothy chapter 2, very familiar to us. Verse 1, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercession, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Oh, this is beautiful. It's really hard to maintain a hardened spirit of rebellion when you're being faithful to pray for your governing authorities. Now, many have pointed out, they would say that the reason we're praying for them is so that they'll do what's right and allow us to lead what it says here, a peaceful and quiet life, right? Wrong. Yes, the prayers may change the governing officials, and we should be praying for them, but listen, the prayers are meant much more to change us than to change them. And you might make the argument that we're praying for them to do what's right so that we can live a peaceful and quiet life, but that argument falls flat and fails when we consider that these prayers are also, quote, that we can be godly and dignified in every way. Godly. This is a word that means to act in a way that is pious, it's from a Greek root word that means to worship or to honor. Acting godly is to act in a way that is honorable, that worships God, that imitates God. And we're to be dignified. This is a word that means to act with propriety and solemnity and holiness and seriousness. And in fact, it's from the same root Greek word for worship that godly comes from. I don't think anybody listening to this would ever say that the government determines that we act in a way that's godly and dignified. 
These are internal spiritual qualities with external outward manifestations. It has nothing to do with the government. No. Instead, we would say this falls into the same category as James 1, verses 2 and 3, where James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. What does this mean? It means that the goal of the trial is not to solve it. The goal of the trial is to let it make you godly, to let it make you dignified, to let it make you more worshipful in your life, which counts trials a joy. Why are they a joy? Because they make you more like your Savior. They make you more like your Savior. Yes, absolutely. We see that there are some governing officials that, maybe using this opportunity as a power grab, and we might even get caught up in conspiracy theories. Is there a conspiracy in the government? Well, at some level, of course there is. Anytime sinners have power, that power may corrupt. Just recently, some legislators in Washington have been attempting to pass ridiculous, wasteful spending under the cover of coronavirus legislation. That happens when sinners have power. That's just the case. And yes... Governing officials may be sinning themselves by failing to uphold the Constitution that they serve. And that makes us sorrowful. Some of the choices that they make have an impact on us personally. But our main goal doesn't change. What, what's the goal? That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That's the goal. It is to make us godly. Don't remove the things that make us godly. Certainly pray and do your best to work through it, but God put them there for a reason. Let me give you a seventh reason, that as a church body, the bride of Christ, we should be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. Reason number seven, to express your trust in God. To express your trust in God. 1 Timothy 2, in verse 3, Paul continues, Why are we to pray for authorities such that it makes us godly and dignified in every way? Verse 3, this is good. It can rightly be translated, this is beautiful. This is lovely. Listen, in any time of suffering, whether you're talking about cancer or financial problems or relational problems or coronavirus, The mature believer strives, yes, to solve the problem with the means given to us, but more importantly, the true believer strives to walk through that trial in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. That's the goal. To demonstrate peace and trust and confidence in His providential plan. Why would we change that now? Why all of a sudden now is the solution to suffering to disobey the Word of God? God, you didn't get it right. You didn't understand what we're going through here, so we're going to take matters into our own hands. No, Paul said to pray for authority so that we can be godly and dignified, and this is good. Now, what does this have to do with trust? Listen carefully. Romans 8, 28, which we looked at in detail recently, comforts us that we know for those who love God, all things work together for what? For good. This is the great statement of the sovereignty of God. And so the question is simple. Do you trust God or not? If, if God has said, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, and if God has said to pray for those in authority so you can be more godly and dignified, and this is good, then obeying the authority that God has put over us demonstrates that we trust the sovereignty of God, that all things will work together for good. We take Him at His word. And I know many of you, and I would fall into this category, have a very heightened sense of injustice when when it happens. And you might ask the question, but how do I handle the injustices I've seen? How do I handle the fact that, that I'm not in church this morning because the government said so? How do I handle injustice? Well, you handle it the same way Job did, when God took away everything that he had. He fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, 
The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin. Do you trust God? Oh no, the church isn't meeting. The, the church is going to fall apart. Evangelical Christianity as we know it in America may go by the wayside. What's going to happen? Do you trust Christ? When he said in Matthew 16, I will build my church, by the way, fully knowing that coronavirus was coming? The fate of the church of Jesus Christ is not in the hands of our governor in reality, but in the mighty hand of the one who has guaranteed her success. How sad it is. How sad it is when many unbelievers are complying with the government and reading in the news that Christians are not. Instead, the unbelievers should be hearing about the peace that passes all understanding. They should be hearing that we believe God when He commanded, do not be anxious about anything. They should be hearing that we trust Jesus when He said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. They should be hearing that our salvation from sin, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is so powerful in our lives that we trust God that all things will be made right, that all wrongs will be vindicated because we believe, according to Zechariah 14.9, that someday the Lord will be king over all the earth. That's what they should be hearing. They should not be reading of Christians defying the government because it ruins our witness and it says we don't trust God. We submit because we trust God. You might say, I don't, I don't like nor do I trust our governor. Could I say this? Who asked you? God didn't. God didn't ask you. He did not require your opinion when he set all things into motion. Isn't it easier and isn't it much more peaceful to just sit back and trust God and let the world see what a peaceful Christian looks like? Let me give you one more reason. Reason number eight. It's a pastor's rule. Anything over three, I don't tell you how many it's going to be. But we are at the last one. Reason number eight. That as a church body, the bride of Christ, we should be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient. Reason number eight. To spread God's gospel. To spread God's gospel. Verse three continues. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Paul says, that we pray for our leaders, that we may be godly and dignified. It's good, it's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. Now, why the emphasis all of a sudden on God, our Savior? Because of the connection that Paul is now going to make to these prayers, to be godly and dignified with your heart attitudes, with your behaviors. Here's the connection. Verse 4, God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Some have said Paul abruptly changes subjects here. The Apostle Paul was arguably, arguably the best educated Jew of his day. I doubt that he just accidentally changed subjects at a bad spot. This isn't just randomly dropped in here as some sort of subject change. In fact, there is a logical progression, progression here as dictated by the grammar. Let me give you a one-minute grammar lesson. We're to pray for our leaders, verse 2, that... It's an adverbial conjunction of purpose. For the purpose of what? Leading peaceful, quiet, godly, dignified lives. Verse 3. This, this is a near demonstrative pronoun referring back grammatically to our peaceful, quiet, godly, dignified lives is good and pleasing to God our Savior. Verse 4. Who, a personal pronoun referring back to the antecedent, our Savior desires that others be saved as well. Listen. Paul has sewn this up tightly that you start, first of all, then I urge the supplications and prayers be made and it takes us to care for the gospel. There's a logical progression from praying for our government to spreading the gospel. How does that always work? I don't know, but he said so. 
God has ordained that in ways we don't fully grasp, our obedience to the government has a return on investment. And that return on investment is the spread of the good news of Christ. Instead of fighting for our rights, how about praying for gospel proclamation through any time the government disappoints us? How often does the government disappoint us? Pretty much 365 days a year. Therefore, we pray for gospel proclamation. Instead of being consumed with anger and indignation when our government disappoints us, how about being consumed for the lost? For souls who are going to hell. Be consumed with passion to see this crisis spread the gospel. Be consumed with zeal for the glory of God to shine through as undoubtedly he will use this time to bring countless people to saving faith in Christ. Listen, just in our little tiny body of believers, and just to give you a context, I live in Bakersfield, California, the United States of America, and for me personally, this is the nicest place I've ever lived. And when I came to Bakersfield and told people, this is the nicest place I, I've ever lived, people who grew up here and make jokes about it kind of said, wow, you must have lived in some really, really bad places. So our, our little corner of the earth here is not paradise by any stretch of the imagination, but in our little corner of the world, in our little tiny body of believers, just here at Grace Bible Church, our, our church is small enough that I could take a marble and I can throw it to any side of the church building. Because of the coronavirus crisis and the government shutdown, we've had many more times the number of people than usual coming to our website. 70% of the visitors to our website are new visitors. Because of this crisis, many of the past messages we've preached have now had many, many more views. We have short gospel videos going out through our Steadfast in the Faith website in both English and Spanish now. Our Sunday morning live streams and total views are consistently going out now to three and four times the number of members we actually have. Our student ministries pastor, Pastor David, his messages on Thursday nights in some cases have gotten hundreds of views. Pastor Darren's hymn sings on Wednesday nights are ministering to people far beyond our own church walls. Apparently, according to him, half of Canada as well. That we know of, this is all we know of, these efforts have been seen in the United States, Canada, Spain, Italy, Australia, Brazil, the UK, and Kenya. And that's all we know of. I've lost track of how many of you have shared with me the new gospel opportunities that have been presented to you during this time. Stuck standing in line while you're social distancing and having 20 and 30 minutes to share the gospel with people around you. And listen, we're not alone. I've heard the same story from many, many pastors I've talked to in the past weeks. If you're a member of Grace Bible Church, you remember that at the beginning of this year, we said this is our year of the Great Commission. Well, God is doing a mighty work in our midst through the government shutdown because of the coronavirus. There is nothing here that we could have planned. We didn't plan that we would literally as a church be reaching more people than we ever have in any given week than we would do in a full three or four months prior to that. Why are we having this gospel opportunity? Because of the sovereignty of God who has allowed the government to shut down churches for a time. One article this week reported that 500 churches in California are reopening on May 31st. Quote, The churches are not asking for permission, said Bob Tyler, a religious freedom attorney advising the pastors. The governor is sitting here as a dictator, trumping the Constitution, and is kind of hanging on to this state emergency for as long as he can hold it. First of all, since when does the Church of Jesus Christ base the outworking of our faith on consulting an attorney? No, we consult the Word of God. Well, the elders of Grace Bible Church have unified, we are unified, in how our church ought to respond, and we've prepared a statement of our position and so pay attention just for a moment as I read to you the statement of our position of the elders of Grace Bible Church. 
Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. That's our position. These are not mutually exclusive commands. We are to do all of them. We are going to obey the government. And we're going to shepherd you in the best way we can, in two ways in particular. First of all, in the coming days, we're going to make certain that every member of Grace Bible Church has the opportunity to be part of a small group and be able to meet online via these meeting platforms. And secondly, we're planning for a reopening strategy as our governor stages roll out. This may include opening small groups to in-person meetings as we're allowed to do so for those who are comfortable to do so. And it will likely include some creative ways for us to begin meeting on the Lord's Day each week in which we'll keep our more vulnerable members safe and we'll love our neighbors and maintain a testimony of being godly and dignified. You'll get an email soon with details about those things. But I have a very serious question to ask you. When this crisis is over, did you walk through it in peace and submission Or did you walk through it in anger and with a rebellious spirit? Can I encourage you to let your boast be that you trusted Christ and you truly believe the sovereignty of God? Well, today, I wanted us to hear specifically from the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul. Because these are two men who are most qualified to instruct us on how to relate to our governing authorities because if the government disappointed anyone, it would be Peter and Paul. Why is that? Peter and Paul were both led to their executions at the hands of the very same government. They wrote in the inspired text of Scripture that we are to obey. There were no protests. There were no lawyers fighting their cause. There weren't even even any last words decrying the tyranny of a corrupt human government. Peter was crucified and Paul was beheaded both in Rome and both to the glory of God. In fact, some of the very last words of the Apostle Paul shortly before his death, 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, listen to this, and bring me safely into His hands heavenly kingdom. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, as a church, we will do our best to comply with the government. Why? To demonstrate loyalty to God, to respect God's decisions, to express our love for God, to rightly represent God, to follow God's priorities, to become more godly, to express our trust in God, and to spread God's gospel. To do any less is to be unfaithful to our God. May He be faithful to us as we obey Him. Let's pray. Our Father, there really is no lack of clarity here. You almost can just let the New Testament fall open at any place and see that we are to obey the authorities set above us, and not just governing authorities, but parental authority and authority in marriage and authority in the church, that the Christian life is a life of submission, and to demonstrate lack of submission is to demonstrate lack of being a Christian, and we don't want that. Lord, I pray for those. I'm certain that there are some listening that are feeling guilt and a sense of conviction, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I pray, Lord, right now that you would help them this very day to establish in their own heart a determination to turn that around, to repent, and to be patient. Because the King of Kings is coming. The Lord of Lords is on His way. It's only a matter of time until the governing authorities which He has placed are replaced by Himself. And Lord, I would pray for a man or a woman watching this who has not come to faith in Jesus Christ, who has not submitted himself to the lordship of the King of Kings, of the Lord of Lords. Coronavirus and government shutdowns are the least of his concerns. He should be concerned about the day of judgment. 
Hebrews 9 says, For it is appointed for man once to die and then to face judgment. And I pray for that person listening, Lord, that this would be the time, this very moment, when the Holy Spirit would move in their heart and he would, remo- he would uh, repent of sin and he would get on his knees by the power of the Spirit, submitted to Christ at the will of the Father and quit worrying about the coronavirus and quit worrying about the government, but now have his sins forgiven. Let us, as the church of Jesus Christ, accurately represent our Lord. Let us not besmirch the name, but give honor to the name of Christ as those who are little Christs. For it is in His name, for His glory, for His honor, that we pray. Amen.